All right, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 13 this morning, this afternoon now. Uh, the pastor has exhorted these believers to run like a determined athlete, not being weighed down, not being slowed down by any kind of sin, any kind of weight. He's told these believers in the first four verses to make certain that they are setting their eyes, they're focusing upon the Lord as they run. As we move into this section today, there are five truths that we're going to zero in on that will help us run well in our faith journey. And so um, they, this is kind of how the, the book is ending, is do these things. So we begin reading, um, and, and really it says, because we are loved. And the because um, part of verses 5 and 6 is there's a, there's a question that's being Asked, it's not actually written down, but it's just anticipated. And, and so I, the author, as he writes in verses 5 and 6, I think his answer to the question of why are we suffering is, well, because we are loved, which may not seem like the, the, the answer you would expect, but you'll see it in the text. It says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which, which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son who, whom he receives. So these believers have come to the conclusion that Jesus of Nazareth is the long awaited Messiah, that he's a redeemer, that he is the one that uh, Moses spoke of and David spoke of, that Isaiah spoke of, and they have found him. He has finally come, and they are following him. But others of their family and their community and the, the Jewish faith are like, are you out of your mind? Jesus is not the Messiah. He was put to death, and he is not the guy. And so you can understand where if we are following the Messiah, why are we going through so much? Why are we being troubled by so many different things? And, and the answer is, well, because you're loved. And, and this is something he says, you have forgotten the exhortation. So trials and tribulations and the correction and the instruction that comes from the Lord, whether it's a trial, whether it's a, uh, a correction that comes in our life because of, of disobedience. And we do know that in the early chapters, they were, they were corrected for having become dull in their heart and hearing, that he rebuked them for not becoming teachers by now, and that he had to lay the first principles, that they had kind of, they had kind of wandered from the Lord. And so maybe this is the correction that is, that's being referred to or the occasion for the correction. But the point is this, you're loved by the Lord. If he didn't love you, he would not correct you. So the basic answer to the question is that suffering and trials and tribulations, they are part of the journey. They are part of what we go through. The Lord can and does bring circumstances into our life like a father to correct us. We can get off course. We can begin to follow something. We can get another priority. And a circumstance can come in our life that is not just natural. It's not just coming because of the way uh, life went. It actually is generated by the Lord to get our attention and to get us back on track. I imagine most of us have some kind of story like, well, the Lord got my attention and this is how he got my attention. And I am so thankful because... I think it could have led me far away, and we, we have the Lord at work. So the Lord uses trials to teach us. And so I'm going to throw that into some of this idea of uh, the chastening or the training or the instruction that we get, as well as our just disobedience to the Lord. Just disobeying the Lord can bring that correction as well. But he, he quotes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, and, and that's what we, we find in verses 5 and 6 uh, to remind them that this is what Scripture says. Now, as we read this, it says that, you know, that we're not to despise the chastening. You're not to be discouraged when you're rebuked. Everyone whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son. But the word scourge probably stands out, I think, to a lot of you. It did to me. It's like scourge. Wow, that's, a, like, that's, a, that's like a big word. This is, Jesus was scourged. And it is the same Greek word for scourge here 
that was used of Jesus when he was flogged by the Roman centurions and ripped him to ribbons. So why would the Lord want to flog us? Well, here's the thing. When you come and you read a dictionary, you know, you can often find definition one and then definition two or three or four or five or six. And if you don't know that there are other meanings of words, um, uh, you may be thrown off. Of course, context always is going to help us determine how that word should be understood. And the context here is, yeah, and there's no way you can associate being loved with being flogged physically. So what are we talking about here? Where This is uh, thought of in a figurative sense, in a metaphorical sense. There is that correction. There is that, that chastening that the Lord could bring. It's nothing more than that. It is not some kind of uh, brutal punishment. Um, Jesus was flogged for us. We do not need to be flogged. Jesus was nailed to the cross. We don't need to be nailed to the cross. He paid and was judged for sin in his body, and, um, and we w- do not have to atone for sin. But because we are his family, because we are his sons and daughters, and he loves us, he is going to correct us. Now, you correct your own children. If you haven't started, you probably should start. Just a little pro tip there. Correct your children, right? Raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And as you do that, you're, sh- you're, you're declaring your love for them. You, you know, we don't correct other people's kids, and they don't correct ours. As much as may, we may want to correct their children sometime, we just don't do that. Because they're not our children. But you are the Lord's. You're his son, you're his daughter, therefore you can expect that correction will come from the Lord. Whether it's correction because you're doing something wrong, thinking a wrong way, because you're engaged in a sinful activity that you shouldn't, because your priorities have gotten out of whack. You're carrying some weights that are slowing you down. These all become opportunities for the the correction, the chastening, or the instruction of the Lord. So you are loved by God, and he is going to correct you. And so our response when the correction or the chastening comes is, well, don't quit. Don't give up. And they definitely were a weary group of people. But learn the lesson that he's trying to teach you and give thanks that he is willing to do that. Can you imagine if God stopped correcting, stopped convicting, Stop giving you that check in your spirit to not walk down that road. If the Lord just said, you're on your own, and he is silent, that would not be good. Because it is that correction and it is that conviction that is so needed in our life. And the fact that he does do this, it is it's important for us. And it's safe for us. And um, so be thankful. Now, we're going to read in a minute. That no correction is pleasant in the moment. But at the 30,000 foot level, looking at the ways of the Lord and our life and his involvement in it, I think we can all say, Lord, thank you that you correct. You probably can look back on a time in your life when you were headed in a direction, you were behaving a certain way, things, trials came into your life, and you needed some wisdom and the Lord gave it to you. Now, it wasn't pleasant at the time of the crisis that created the need to be instructed and taught by the Lord. But you can look back now and say, I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that for those lessons I learned in that time. And, you know, the reality is this. And it's not the only way. And I don't have a verse that says it's even the best way. But I can tell you in my life, God seems to get my attention the most when there is correction, when there is some kind of trial going on. And, you know, again, it's not that God has to do it that way. There's plenty of times when he's done it other ways. But, boy, when, those, when everything begins to go crazy in your life, you really do kind of look up and listen a little bit harder. So, hey, this, we're loved. Um, that's why you have things that are going on that are difficult and hard in your life. Your love, the Lord is, is in that place. But correction also means that your family, verses 7 and 8. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with, his, as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, 
of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. The correction you receive is proof that you have been adopted into the family of God. Again, if you weren't his child, then he wouldn't correct you. He wouldn't convict you. He wouldn't chasten you. Instruction in trials is proof that God is wanting to train you up and me up in his ways. The trial comes and he has something to say. Now listen, I think that we can learn something about ourselves and a better way to live, a better way to conduct ourselves, even if it has become, the trial or the hardship or the suffering has come because of somebody else's sin in our life. You, you can say, and I can say, and I try to say, when things like that happen, it's like, Lord, you know, sometimes I'm not innocent, right? Sometimes you're not innocent. Sometimes, yeah, I earned that. I sinned. I didn't think before I spoke or whatever it might be. But there are times where it's like, that's not right. I'm not guilty as charged. That is not what I did. That is not what I said. That is not what I thought. And that is incorrect. And, and so they're saying this about me or they're acting this way towards me. And, you know, that who, nobody ever thinks that feels good. But you know what I've, I've come to say to the Lord is like, Lord, while I think that I am innocent in this, I'm open for your instruction. I'm open for correction. If I am getting it wrong, then speak to me. But even if I am right, Lord, I know that you can still teach me and instruct me through this painful exchange I'm going through. And the Lord will teach you even when you are innocent. It's like, well, I'm innocent. I can grind on that person. I can rail on that person. No, you can be instructed by the Lord. That's what you can do. And say, Lord, teach me even in this more about your ways. Help me to identify more with your sufferings. Let me see more of what you've gone through. And the Lord will teach and instruct. Verses 9 and 10. Well, before we get there, just one more thing. God is speaking. God is chastening. God is instructing. God is correcting in our life. If you are in a trial, hardship, if you have, you know, the hand of the Lord is upon you and he's, he's bringing circumstances to bear to get you to turn, he's speaking and you need to hear him. And it isn't he will speak. No, he is speaking. And so you need to listen. And if you're like, well, I just can't hear the Lord, then shut every other input down in your life. And it's just like you can listen to so many other people and so many other things. And you can be caught up with this busyness. And you're distracting from what's actually going on and confronting and dealing with the issue through this hobby and through this busyness and through that. You know, shut it all down. And just say, God, here I am, your servant. I'm listening now. Speak to me. And he will speak, and he will lead you, and he will guide you through this time. So correction means your family. So you need to know that. You know, like, well, I don't think God loves him anymore. He corrected me. Uh, exact opposite. He, 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 if he didn't love you, he wouldn't correct you. He wouldn't be engaged in that aspect of your life. You know, I'm sure my kids would say, Dad must have loved us a whole lot because I corrected my kids a lot. I, you know, I didn't, um, and I didn't always do it right. There were times where I had to go and apologize to them. But, you know, I was engaged in that. Um, they were my kids. I wasn't going to let them misbehave. I wasn't going to let them, you know, uh, treat people poorly. I wasn't going to let them you know, uh, throw an attitude. I, w I wasn't going to let that happen. I wanted my kids to be raised in the ways of the Lord. I wanted them to be corrected. And so, because they're my family, they're there. We had one kid come over to our house one time. <laughs> this, this will tell you about my house. One kid came over one time, and my kids took them aside and began to tell them all the rules of the house. <laughs> and the child said, wow. There's a lot of rules in this house. It's like, yeah, there are a lot of rules in our house, I guess. But th we wanted our kids to know how to, to, to conduct themselves. And so we were engaged. Look at verses 9 and 10. God is a better father. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? 
For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. Yeah, you did the best you could, Dad. But he for our profit, that we may partake, be partakers of his holiness. So God is a better father, and if he's a better father, then he's worthy of more respect. Um, earthly fathers, moms, dads, you know, discipline as they think is best. But you don't always get it right. You do know that, right? You know, you'll look and like, oh, I thought it was you. No, that was, you know, my brother. That was my sister. Or no, that didn't happen at all. This is what happened. And, and you're like, okay, I'm wrong. I'm sorry, I, di I didn't do that. And so we do the best we can. Um, and there is respect that is shown by the kids. Now, this didn't happen often. But it stands out in my mind. We had had a vacation with another family, had kids. And um, this week was not a good week for their family in obedience, I guess. I don't know. But um, they're like, we're disrespectful. They were mouthy. They wouldn't do what the parents asked. Um, and there was just, there was meltdowns and emotional, emotional temper tantrums. And um, at the end of that vacation, and all of our kids, none of them were teenagers, they, they, they commented on that. And they said, we are so glad that you correct us and you don't let us behave like that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> God, you know that you don't get those very often. But there was some respect that was shown. It's like, thank you for teaching us how to behave properly because we see what improper behavior is and we don't want to be like that. And this is the, what the Lord is doing. And we should be able to respond to the Lord and say, thank you, Lord. I don't want to be like that. I don't, I don't want to think like that. I don't want to talk like that. I don't, want to, I don't want to love like that. I don't want to, you know, be that kind of person. I want to be a person that is, is kind and generous and loving. That's what I want to do. And the Lord's like, well, we're on the same page. I'm going to lead you right into that. So it means your family. And, um, and he is, and then next, we're looking at verse 9, 10. God is a better father. We did the best we could, but we didn't always get it right. Um, but the Lord does get it right completely. And how are some of the ways in which the Lord corrects us? As you think through scripture, how did the Lord correct some of these Old Testament saints? You could probably come up with a long list, but let me just throw out a few. Old Testament, New Testament, no particular order. How about... Ananias and Sapphira. There's some chastening. Do you remember who they are? This is the couple that they, they were wealthy. They had some land. There was lots of needs financially in the church at this time. And so people were selling their property. And they were coming and they were giving gifts. Sometimes they gave 100% of the proceeds to, uh, uh, to the church. And they could attend to the needs and the mission of the church. Um, and there was this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they had a piece of property. We don't know how much they sold it for, and we don't know how much they gave. But I'm just going to, I'm going to assign some numbers to it, just because I think it might be easier to follow. So they, let's say they sold the, the land for 100000 And then they de decide, though, that they're going to go and give 75000 That's generous, right? They're going to give $75,000 to the church but he said, but let's not tell them we got 100. Let's tell them that we are giving 100% of the proceeds so we will be thought to be the most generous people at church. It was hypocrisy. It was pride. They were building their reputation in an act of worship. And so they come to Peter, and Ananias walks in. And he goes, Peter, um, sold property, and we just love the work that's going on here. So here's $75,000. It's 100% of the proceeds. We want you to contribute it. And the Lord speaks to Peter and says, he's lying. He's going to die. Tell him that. He says, did you really give that? You gave that much, and he dropped dead. Boom, right there. And so um, called a couple of the deacons in said, hey, take the dead body out. I mean, I don't know what you do about an insurance, you know, claim on that one. But, uh, you know, this was... This was what happened. Sapphira is not there. A little while later, she comes in. She says, have you seen Ananias? Yeah, I actually did see him not so long ago. I got a question for you. He said that you gave, um, you sold the property for $75,000 and you gave $75,000. Did you really do that? Yep, we gave it all to you. 
well, your husband's dead and now you're going to die too. And she dropped dead. This is such a, 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 it's a statement, it's an exclamation point in the church by the Lord saying, don't be a hypocrite, which is not the same as being a sinner. Because guess what? All of us do that. All of us sin, but hypocrisy is different. Hypocrisy is you're sinning, but you're pretending like you're walking in righteousness. Sinning and saying, uh, I need a lot of help. That's not hypocrisy. That's called honesty. That's called being truthful. And so it isn't just that they missed the mark. It's that they were being a hypocrite. And the Lord wants a pure and spotless bride. And so he made an exclamation point. How about David in the Old Testament? He committed sin. He committed uh, murder and adultery. And these same kind of troubles were in his household. And the Lord said, these things are going on because of your sin. He dealt with a chastening and a correction in his house. Now listen. Listen. His behavior set a pattern. And that pattern was sadly followed. And the Lord said, this is, this is on you. You could look at other situations in Scripture as well. There's, I mean, there's a long list of them. Moses isn't going to the promised land because of his sin. Um, in the book of Revelation, it talks about how the Lord gives us space to repent. And if you don't repent, then I'm going to come and I'm going to chasten you. So, the Lord comes quietly to us first. And in private, he calls us to repentance, to correction, to train us and instruct us. If we reject that, if we refuse that, then don't be surprised when this followed up with a public exposure of that. That's, that's now moved into the realm of chastening. And so the Lord is speaking. And maybe you are the only one that knows right now that area that needs to be corrected in your life. Do yourself a favor. Honor the Lord. Yield to him and be done with that. Because for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. If you're a believer, you, you myself, and everyone else is going to get the correction from the Father. And you know, if you're a parent, and I'm sure you all do this. If you don't, you need to start. The first line of correction for your children is not a spanking. You do know that, right? That's like we have reached the end of all other opportunities to bring correction and, and change that behavior. We've talked with you. We've talked with you again. We've given you some um, you know, warnings that if you do this again, it's going to happen. And now here we are. We've got to the place where you have worked very, very hard for this spanking. Congratulations. Here you go. But that's not the first place we go. That's the last place we go. Yes. And with the Lord, the first place he goes is not in chastening, but it's in the correction form of it. It's the instruction. Yes. And I mean, listen, it, no parent loves or enjoys giving a spanking. It's like, it is not fun at all on any level. And when it does it, it changes the mood of the house. I mean, everything, you know, there's all kinds of emotion that gets thrown into the mix now. But we, we like to correct with our, our words. Sometimes we like to correct with our, our face. All of us have been out in public with our kids when they're doing the wrong thing. You don't say anything and you don't do anything, but you give them the look. The eyebrows go up. You're like, really? You want me to cock? I'm cocking my head and raising my eyebrows. You know what that means. You had better get in line. And, you know, sometimes it's just being, you just look at them. You watch what's going on. And you just, you're just looking at them and you're just saying, you know, that's not right. You don't say a word, but they know you're saying, this is not right. Your behavior is out of line. You need to stop that. I don't want to say anything. If you'll correct yourself, I won't say anything. And there won't be any further consequences. You know, this is what you're hoping they'll, they'll respond to. And it, and it often does, right? Well, your father doesn't want to spank you. He doesn't want to bring chastening into your life. He'd rather just speak to you. He'd rather just look at you. As a matter of fact, Psalm 32, 
verses 8 and 9 says that he will lead us with his eye. But if necessary, he says, don't be like the horse or like the mule that have to be led with a bit and a bridle. Don't make me put a piece of metal in your mouth with leather straps and pull your head to the left or the right. I will do that. Don't do that. Look at my eye. I, I want to lead you with my eyes. I don't, want to, I don't want to bring this kind of harshness into your life. But I will do that. And we have so many examples in Scripture. Well, forget Scripture. We have enough examples in our own life where he does that. Why? Because he loves so verses 9 and 10, God is a better father. Father, But I want you to notice the last phrase. Look at the last phrase of verse 10. Why does this correction, why does this chastening come? That we may be partakers of holiness. Is that what it says? That's not what it says, is it? That we may be partakers of what? His holiness. Does that three-letter word make a difference? Oh, it makes all the difference in the world. This is elevated. This is, this is, now I get to look like God. Not that I become God. But my character, my behavior, my thoughts, my reactions, my priorities, they become like that. I'm being shaped into the image of the Lord. I'm not trying to just, you know, check off one more commandment. I'm not trying to obtain to some level of, of obedience to some kind of moral code that's posted somewhere. I'm wanting to look Jesus wants me to look more like him. And if I rebel against that and I refuse that, I'm like, I don't want to walk in holiness. I don't want to obey. Then let me ask. You know, we've all been there. Troy's been there too. What is it in the character and the nature of Jesus Christ that we find unbecoming or something that is offensive that we wouldn't want to look like him? That's what holiness is about. It's not about some code of ethics. It's about being like him and this is the correction he's making you to be more like his son that is a privilege and that is an honor verse 11 now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present but painful nevertheless afterward it yields peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it so the idea of training kind of brings back in that metaphor of the athlete and so thinking about that the first phrase is no chastening I'm going to say no training seems to be joyful for the present. Now, some of you are addicted to working out. What's wrong with you? You know, okay. Now, some of you are just like, you are just like, you love to work out. It's like, I love working out. Okay, the rest of us don't. We're not addicted to that. We have willpower and we can quit at any time, right? We, we're able to control that in our life. Um, but, you know, it's like, even last night, it's like we've been out, we've been working in the yard doing this and that, and... And I'm like, uh, you know, it was a warm day. So I was like, all right, it's time to take a shower. It's getting ready to, to go in there. I'm like, you haven't worked out. I'm like, I don't want to work out. I've, you know, I've, this, is all, this is all going on in my own head, right? I don't want to work out. I've worked out all day. I was in the yard. I did this. I did that. I don't need to work out. I don't have to work out. You need to work out. You know, your doctor, whatever, you know, your back. You need to work out. I was like, well, I don't want to work out. Uh, all right, I'm going to work out. It didn't seem pleasant at the time uh, to think about going upstairs and doing that. And when I was doing it, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy any of it. I didn't enjoy breathing hard. I, I just didn't enjoy it. That's the thing. It's like, well, you just, you need to run. I got a car. I don't need to run. I mean, so, you know, this is the, I would rather do something. Like, give me a sport. Give me, have me hike or whatever. That, that's right. But that's, that takes a lot more time, right? So this is what I'm relegated to doing is, is doing it. And it never seems, you know, present for the time. But once you get it done, oh, once you're done, it's like, I've worked out. Yeah, I worked out. Yeah, you whined about it the whole time, though. It's like, yeah, but I worked out. And you feel good about it. Am I uh, right? You feel good about the fact, I did it. I, I'm, I'm actually doing this thing that I know I should be doing. And it's good for my body. Is you know, whatever. So that's what the correction is like from the Lord. It's never enjoyable when the correction is coming in your life. It's not fun to have your wife say, hey, by the way, or your husband to say, you know, the attitude with the kids lately, or to have somebody say, I noticed that you have really pulled back and you're not engaged in prayer or whatever, or you're not serving anymore. Wait, what? No. Who likes to be confronted? Nobody likes to be confronted, but it is necessary training. We need that in our life. And, and look at this. 
The, the, the title of this point, or the, the point is, how about some peace? What is the result? It's not only is it, do we become more like the Lord? The result is, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So there's holiness, righteousness again. God corrects us to get us living the right way. God instructs us in the trial to not make the mistake so we live the right way. When we make the right choice, when we repent of sin, when we engage in that thing we've been commanded to do, we are now walking in righteousness. And guess what begins to descend upon your life? Peace. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. Righteousness is a good way to live. It honors the Lord. But here's what it does. It will produce peace around your life. Oh, there's always going to be turmoil on some level. But you know what? Turmoil that comes from outside is a lot easier to deal with than turmoil that comes because I am in disobedience. You know, there, it just, it, it, it feels different. It's so much more difficult because you know better. You know it's not the right thing. So listen, if you are in that place where there is a lack of peace in your life, well, the Bible says that God does not give peace to the sinner. He withholds that. Praise the Lord that he does. Could you imagine, as we talked about last week, if he made you peaceful in your sin and rebellion? Wow, that would not, that would not be kind, would it? That would be something that would cause us to, to um, go further down the road of stumbling. So, hey, peace is removed. But when we walk in righteousness, now peace comes around your life. Now listen, if in your life, every church you've ever been to, every job you've ever had, every neighbor you've ever had, and every friend you ever had, you've ended up in a conflict with, guess what? You're the problem. You're, you are the common denominator. Now, you may have some extreme circumstance that would not say that's true. Okay, fine. But as a general rule, if you have conflict with everybody, you're the one that's involved in all those relationships. And if you begin to look at your life, you may be causing uh, the, 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 you know, the, the turmoil in those relationships because you're mouthy, because you can't control you know, your, your tongue, and you say things that offend people, and you're unwilling to say you're sorry. You, you become pig-headed. You become stubborn. Don't think about that other person. Think about yourself right now, okay? Well, let's all dial in. We're talking, we're holding up the mirror. Troy's holding up the mirror. I'm looking at it. You're looking at it. And, and you, you don't walk in holiness. You are stingy. You, it's all about getting more. You're not generous. You're not giving. If you see somebody in need, you withhold. And you don't give to that legitimate need. And you, and, you, and you wonder why there's conflict all around you. It's because that's sin. Every one of those things is sin. It is unrighteousness. But if we will walk in righteousness, you will begin to feel the peace, of, the, the, the peace that comes with that fruit in your life. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now, people outside, persecution is still going to happen. But at least you're not the cause of it. You're not the one that's stoking those flames. So, yeah, the Lord wants you to walk in peace. We close here in verses 12 and 13. Don't make it more difficult than it already is. That's the lesson I want us to, to pull out of here. And I'm going to read from New Living Translation. So, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. And um, yeah, so a couple of points here. First point is you, you may feel like, verse 12, that you're ready to give in. You're to, ready to give up. That certainly is how these believers felt. Like, I can't take another step. And the Holy Spirit says to them, stand fast. Buck up, soldier. Grab the sword. Grab the, the plow. Put your hands on it. Keep pressing on. Don't give up. Don't, don't quit. Where are you going to go? Uh, when, when Peter was asked a question by Jesus, when people were walking away and leaving, he says, are you going to leave me too? And he goes, you kidding me? Who else has the words of life? Where, where am I going to go? I mean, I, 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 if I quit on you, I quit on life. And you ha we have no option to quit. That's not an option. And so hang in there, 
Stand fast and you will find that God will give you the grace. You know, what did Paul say in all that he went through? He says, who is sufficient for these things? He, he, he felt that in himself. I don't have what it takes in myself to do this work, but I will trust in the grace of God. He will give me the sufficiency I need. And the last point there in verse 13 is, you know, if, you're, if somebody's walking on a path and they have weak knees and they have weak ankles and they're tired and ready to fall and they decide to go on some, you know, arduous uh, uh, trail that doesn't have firm footing and it's slippery and rocks are moving underneath you and there's big holes and stuff. Well, you can kind of, you know how that story is going to end. They're going to fall, they're going to twist an ankle, twist a knee, and it's going to be worse off. So what do you want to do for somebody who can't walk very smooth? All of us have done this with somebody that's on crutches or, you know, maybe it's somebody that's older. And we have to go somewhere. You're looking for the easy path. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe you're like, no, it's for me. It's not for grandpa. It's me. I'm looking for the easy path. Okay. But you're looking for that easy path that's not going to trip you up. Well, we need to apply that spiritually. When you're walking in an unrighteous path, when you're walking in a, a path that's full of twists and turns of unrighteousness, don't be surprised when you or anybody else who's traveling with you falls as well. Amen. So listen, mom and dad. Listen to that. You're walking and you're walking on a path of unrighteousness and somehow you think you're the only one that's got to negotiate the boulders and the unstable footing. Not so. Everybody in your house, and like, well, they don't even know this is going on. They may not, but do you want to know who does know? Satan knows. Satan knows, and he will do it. A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. It, the, the verse doesn't say a little bit of leaven will leaven the whole lump if everybody knows there's a little bit of leaven. That's not the way the verse goes. And so you're, you're making it, and you can, you can really feel that, that interpretation coming out of uh, in the New Living Translation. Make out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. Amen. Make it easy. Make it easy for your your family to follow righteousness. Make it easy for those in your peer group to follow righteousness. For yourself, it is so much easier to walk on a straight, well-lit path. And of course, that's what it is, right? The word of God is a light unto our feet, a light unto our path. It will show us where to step. But if you're out there living it your way, it's a dangerous path and you will find yourself tripping and falling over and over again. I'm sure some of you have, you know, you, you, you've maybe said something like this. It's like, how do all these crazy things happen in their life? Now, sometimes it's just, it's the trials and tribulations that come. But often, all the crazy things are coming into their life because they're on a treacherous trail. That's why they're there. But if you will walk with the Lord, you will have a straight path in front of you where to place your feet. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to have trials and tribulations, but you know you're not going to fall in those trials and tribulations. Be resolved to press on and experience the strength that God gives to all of his sons or daughters. You may feel like, I just can't do it. My hands are too weak. Yes, yes, you can. You're, you'll be all right. Pick up your hands. Put it back on the sword. Get your hands back on that plow, the work the Lord has called you to. Well, my, we, my knees are too weak. Just stiffen them up and watch how the Lord will show up and he will give you strength and he will give you the ability to get the work done. Listen to this. God does not call us into failure. God is glorified in that we bear much fruit. So his glory is on the line. It's about his work. It's about his kingdom. And yes, fortunately, it's about our lives too. So may we, may we hear this word, may we know these truths and not allow the enemy to trip us up. May we be corrected. If you're like, well, this is a great message. I should have heard this three weeks ago beforehand. But now I'm on the chastening side of things. Now I'm on the side of everything's crumbling and falling apart. So what do I do? Here's what you do. You come to the Lord and you tell him that you're sorry. And you repent of that. You make real repentance decisions 
And now watch how the grace of God will come upon you. Where sin abounds, grace abounds almost as much. No, that's not what it says. It abounds what? Much more. God's grace will outdo your sin and my sin. Father, thank you for your grace. And we need it, Lord. We needed it in our marriages. We need it in our jobs. We need it in the, the business we own that's not going as well. Lord, we need your grace. We need your favor. Lord, bring us to the place of repentance. Bring us to the place where we hear your instruction and correction. And Lord, we say, thank you for it. Thank you that you always correct us and lead us into the good paths. You never lead us into darkness. Lord, you never need us, lead us into more uh, trouble. And we are grateful for it. So Lord, we love you. We follow you. We set you as the, uh, as the father that has a right to say whatever you want to say to us. So speak to us, we pray. I give you a moment to respond. Maybe you're, the Lord is speaking to you and it's, hey, it's a quiet conversation. He's, just, he's using his eyes right now and you need to listen to him. No, maybe it's gotten too chastening. There's grace, there's forgiveness. He's not done with you. And if you're one that's like, wow, I never experienced correction ever. I sin all the time and I never feel bad about it. Well, remember who he corrects. He corrects sons and daughters. If you don't know of the disapproval of God for walking in sin, then that means you're not a son or a daughter. And there's nothing scarier that can be said than that. But the good news is this. There's a lot of room in Father's house. And all of his kids, every one of his sons, every one of his daughters, the one speaking to you right now, we all are adopted in. And if you're not in the house of God, he's still adopting. He's still welcoming him. And I encourage you to receive the Lord today. I'll give you a moment to respond and then we are going to close in prayer. Lord, we just acknowledge that your ways are the right ways. Even if we don't know exactly what that way is right now, we know that whatever you're going to say to us, it's going to be the right thing. Give us the zeal and the passion, the determination to only walk in your truth, your word, your ways, in, in keeping with your character and nature. Lord, we don't want to do it our way. We repent of our stubbornness and our foolishness, our lethargy in being done with lesser things. Lord, you are God, you are Father, and we yield to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand together.